In this video we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about the Monitoring Site Planner and show you some of the features and how they work and what they mean. Um, first of all we'll start off with the different areas of the application and uh, what they are. So on the panel on the left we have the map and the map is used to show each of the variables that we have data for. Um, you can see the list of variables. Each of these basically come from the different criteria that are available. So we've got various water quality metrics, uh, temperature, current, and then um, historic data um, and the breakdown of the historic data. So you can use these to look at different um, gradients um, and then if you need to look at the legend you can access that and you can also add more layers if you for example wanted to find things like um, zoning um, which might be a useful reference layer then you can add that as well let me just turn that down so now we have zoning in the background if you find that the um, particular sites are obscuring it then you can use this to remove the different sites. So there's a few features within the map that allows you to configure up different maps to investigate the different environmental gradients. So that's the map feature. On the right we have various ways of getting data in and out of the application and also doing optimization. Now we might start by uploading um, the list of reefs that correspond to the existing monitoring program. Now each of the reefs are referenced by their ID and you get this from when you've created a um, particular program you, you in the tool you can download the list of reefs you scroll to the bottom this particular bottom a button allows you to um, see what reefs are in the current design. So you can use that to basically set up and copy and paste um, different designs into the tool. On the calculations tab we have the different performances of the various different criteria. So we have the currents which is and we have various water quality ones and the other criteria. This column here shows the current performance of the monitoring program against that score in an unweighted way. So if you're going to design any particular monitoring program, clearly you don't want to just optimize for one result. You want to capture historic data, you want it to do well on zoning, and you want it to reconstruct environmental gradients but not all of these parameters are equally important so for example if we want to retain a lot of historic data then we might set the scale to say four and if we want it to do well with blue green zone pairings then we might give that a high weighting now the NRM zoning well it really just tells us that we've got a fair number of reefs in each of the NRMs it's a little bit of an artificial um, criteria and so we might downweight that one significantly. We want our program to do well in temperature. Um, well, first we're going to enable which criteria we're going to use. We'll use these ones and at the moment we're just going to use one of the temperatures and we'll let the weight be one. We'll keep Seki at one and we're not going to use these water quality ones and we're going to keep the current. Current's less important, so we'll set it at half. Okay, so that on the right we can see the weighted score, and then we end up with the overall score, the performance of this particular monitoring program. We can also look at the approximate cost in terms of the number of ship days that it would take to do this monitoring. Now we slide this around. So here you can see very approximately each of the trips, um, including the steaming time, 
and uh, going back to port. So that's useful for um, just looking at a little bit between the different designs, how they perform. Okay. Now the last part is, oh well, not the last part, but one of the important parts is the model. So here we can see on this left side, this is the original data that's driving the environmental gradients. And then when we scroll it across, we can see the estimate of that environmental gradient based on the monitoring sites alone. Now the idea is that if we have a good monitoring program, then it should be able to reconstruct the environmental gradients. Now each of those environmental gradients are conditions that the coral reefs have to grow against. Therefore they act as a little bit of a proxy for pressures that act on those reefs and will influence the coral community. Since we want to actually capture all of those dynamics in our monitoring program, our monitoring program should be able to reconstruct those gradients. Clearly this design does not do a particularly good job in Cape York because it doesn't actually have any monitoring sites in Cape York. Now we can either, I'm going to zoom in, manually select additional sites to monitor. So we can click on a site and that will be added to the monitoring program. And you'll see live updates of each of the results and the overall score. Now you can see here that as I add sites, um, each of the criteria will be changing. So you can see the score went down significantly when I added that site. I'll add it. School went up. Sometimes it will go up because we happen to have picked a site which results in something that's non representative of the various gradients, and when it gets extrapolated out, makes the score even worse. This makes it actually quite challenging to manually come up with a program which is a good representation. But as you can see, by adding just a few sites in the north, we've significantly improved the overall score. We have reduced the performance, oh, sorry, we've improved the performance for Secchi, we've improved the performance for temperature and current. We can also see that it's costed an additional trip, essentially, quite a lot of extra time. Now, it's going to take a lot of work to obviously work out the best combination to do this manually. So at this point we might consider using the optimization tools. Now this particular optimization tool uses evolution to try to find a good solution. Now it's always a good idea to name your, uh, your runs. Each of these runs take a significant time. Uh, they typically take hours to days to do this optimization and so you want to plan and record each of your runs. Here I'm going to do a very short optimization just so you can see how it performs. Now here we're actually telling it which particular model to use for its reconstruction. This is the number of sites that we want in our optimized monitoring program. Here we're going to retain basically the same number of sites as we already have. If we give it a starting set of reefs, then it will use those as the starting point for the evolution. Since the solution that we've currently got is pretty good, it may not find a better solution in such a short run. So we added, I don't know, six more and it started with 160, so we'll do 166. This particular one is a slightly complicated one. This is really, um, it's kind of the number of generations, but there's two parameters that go into how many things that need to be run. So um, yeah, I won't really explain this very well, but we're going to start at 10,000 um, and we're going to do 10 generations. This is basically the starting generation so this sets how much noise, how much we're going to move the sites around each um, each generation. And so 
in this run, because I want it to be quite quick, I'm actually going to start it as though it's almost at the end of the simulation. This will mean that it's only moving a few reefs at a time. In each generation we're going to give it 10. Um, that means each generation of the evolution it has a population of 10 possible scenarios. It will then evaluate those and then find the best solutions, the best two of them, and then pair them to create the next generation. This particular setting is whether to keep all the must-have sites. So there's about 15 sites that are included that are basically not really captured by the monitoring but are considered essential in terms of retaining them in the overall result. So here we'll start the uh, optimization process. Now we'll, you'll find that the evolution takes quite a long time when you include environmental gradients. So here we've seen this is basically showing each generation. Each time you get one of these, it means that it's found a slightly improved result. This is saying that it's attempting to move one reef at a time. If we had added more noise in, it would attempt to move multiple reefs at a time. And um, this will soon be done because we only asked it to do 10 generations. Now obviously with that short run we didn't actually improve things that much but when we download results we get a spreadsheet basically showing the score at each point and now we can see the um, slightly improved result. You can see it's moved some of these reefs around. The last tool is this thinning out. Now what this will do is take the existing program and remove reefs from it. What it does is sequentially evaluates if I remove one reef, what is the performance, and then I go to the next one. I keep doing that, test it for everyone, and whichever one has the least contribution to the score gets thrown out. And it does that for ever how many that you tell it to remove. So in our case, I'm going to remove Actually, before we start this, we're going to look at the overall score. And then we'll see an interesting fact. So it's 2.54. We're now going to thin them out. Now this thinning out is going to take a while, so I'm going to speed up the video at this point. Now it's been about four minutes and we can see that it's removed six reefs from the monitoring program. Now the curious thing is that as you remove reefs from the program, the score often gets much better, at least initially. Quite often you can remove 20%, 30%, even 50% of the reefs if you're starting off with a poor design. Um, and the score does not get significantly worse. Now effectively what's happening is we're removing reefs that don't contribute to the overall performance. Particularly reefs that are very close together, um, don't typically add much, or that they're reefs that are not particularly representative of their area and so they actually make the interpolation process perform worse. It's about 15 minutes later and the thinning out is complete. Here we can see which reefs were thinned out and the final score at each stage. So we can see that we started off with 2.54 and after removing 20 reefs, uh, we basically ended up with the same score. These reefs were not really contributing much at all or causing problems in the overall scheme. So this is a really powerful way of reducing the overhead of doing any monitoring program. Um, while still keeping a good performance. Once you've found the perfect design, you should save the IDs to a text editor for later. You can always take this list and then re-upload it using the upload button. That's essentially the save. You can also download a CSV file. So take this text, put it in a notepad editor, and then um, save it as a .csv file. 
and it contains the information required to create um, a GIS file. It also contains an attribute which tells you whether that reef has been an existing monitored reef, whether it's a new reef or one which has been removed from the monitoring program. So there you have it, the Monitoring Site Planner is a tool for planning new monitoring designs for the Great Barrier Reef, but we have to remember that it, is, it only captures certain criteria um, and not all the nuances about the monitoring program. So we should take the lessons that we get from these and then carefully look at each of the reefs that the system has selected. Well, thank you. Have, have a go at the tool. See what you can find um, and see what you can discover. All right. See you next time.